Welcome to the Vineyard Church Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. For more information on this podcast or other resources, go to vineyardlive.us. To learn more about us, go to the vineyardchurch.us. Welcome to the Vineyard. We are so glad you joined us this weekend. You know, we've all been scattered in the summer. Vacations, reunions, but it's so good to gather in the presence of God, isn't it? And we've had a fun time this summer with our message series, Summer at the Movies, Real Identity. And I will conclude that today. But Hap, my husband and I, decided to have our own fun at the movies this summer, and I did something I've never done in my entire 66 years, and I went to the theater and saw a superhero movie. <laughs> yeah, don't shout me down. You know, I know we're a little bit of fuddy-duddies, but you need to give us a, a tad of grace because both Happy and I were raised in a faith that said both the theater and movies were evil. And so it's quite a step. I mean, we're not only now going to the movies, we're preaching on the movies. So, hey. <laughs> um, but So I was... Um, as I often do, I read the movie reviews in USA Today, and I saw one for um, Wonder Woman, but I just about passed it over because I don't like sci-fi, I don't like fantasy, I actually don't like action, I like real, R-E-A, life. But a headline caught my eye, and it said it has a positive message for women. So I read the whole review, and man, I was hooked. And I go to Hap, and I say, I want to go see Wonder Woman. He goes, is it out on DVD? I'm like, oh, no, see, oh, that's another thing. We hardly ever go to the theater. We prefer to snuggle on the couch. That's another thing. But so uh, I went, no, but I want to go. He's like, well, okay. Uh, so that Friday night, we headed to Savoy 16, and wow. It wasn't long before I was thoroughly immersed in this amazing drama of Diana Prince, a.k.a. Wonder Woman, and her mission to save people with both compassion and power. And I knew she had a message. This message had, this movie had a message for us. Not just real identity, R-E-E-L, but real, R-E-A-L, real identity. And it's a message, I believe, that we need to hear, and it is this. As sons and daughters of the living God, no, not mythical Zeus, that's Diana's father, we can be victorious, overcome the real enemy, Satan, not mythical Ares, <laughs> but we can actually make the world a better place for others and for ourselves. That is the message of real identity. We are sons and daughters of the living God. We can be victorious, overcome the enemy, not just for ourselves, but for others. And that is exactly, you know, in many ways that the movie Wonder Woman communicated. And I love how Wonder Woman wouldn't apologize for being a woman because she didn't, she didn't grow up in a world that said women can't do certain things. No, she, she knows who she is. She discovers her destiny. And she doesn't belittle men. No, together they team to do what's right. They save people. And so, I, I, again, I loved all the, the themes coming through, and, and not the least of which was the message about women. You know, in the beginning, God created male and female in his image, both equal, in dominion, in authority. And through sin, Satan, and the curse, of course, women have been horribly oppressed all through the centuries. But Jesus has redeemed us from that curse. That's the good news. And not just women. No, it's male, female, black, white, liberal, conservative, slave, free. It doesn't matter through faith in Jesus Christ. The cross says we are free to be who God created us to be. And it's an amazing message. We are all sons and daughters of the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we want to live that out, right? And I don't only want to be just a wonder woman, I want to be a signs and wonder woman. You know, we as a tribe, we believe in signs and wonders, right? We believe the sick should be healed, the demonized should be delivered. Yes, the, the poor fed, the dead raised. We actually believe that. And that's part of our destiny as sons and daughters of the living God. 
We are victorious, but we are in a battle. So let's pray. Well, Father, you know. You know us. You love us. You've redeemed us. And we want to live out the full destiny that you've given us as your sons and daughters. We want to enforce the victory that Jesus won. So come today and continue to teach us, empower us, and confirm your message with signs and wonders in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are victorious. The Bible is clear on that. But we are in a battle. So I thought, let's open up watching how Wonder Woman handles the battle. I used to want to save the world. This beautiful place. But the closer you get, the more you see the great darkness within. this the hard way a long long time ago what is your mission to stop the war what war the war to end all wars weapons far deadlier than you can ever imagine a walk can be ours whoever you are you are in more danger than you think i cannot stand by while innocent lives are lost Be careful, Diana. Who is this woman? She's my um, secretary, sir. <laughs> she's, she's a very good secretary. It is our sacred duty to defend the world. And it's what I'm going to do. It's still at the theaters, if your ears can take it. <laughs> but just like Wonder Woman, we are in a battle. We're in a kingdom of God battle. We've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness, translated into the kingdom of light, but we're now enforcing that amazing victory that Jesus won at the cross and the resurrection victory over sin, Satan, and death. And, you know, to that end, our lives can be messy, stressful, and difficult. You know, you're, you, you only have to be awake about one hour before that reality hits you again, right? But I think often Christians are confused because they read the message of the Scripture and all the awesome, glorious things that are ours, and then, why? Why isn't it real? Well, it doesn't automatically happen, which is what we want to look at today. It doesn't just automatically happen, all right? So they don't get, our issues don't get straightened out even in 90 minutes like they do on screen. Okay, the Apostle Paul actually has a name for this fight, and he calls it the fight of faith, the good fight of faith, actually. And it's a real battle. We're not always in a battle, but we are in a fight of faith. Faith is very significant. I don't personally like the idea of being in a fight. Um, I am a peacekeeper by nature. I was actually raised in a pacifist home, so I don't like it. But I also take issue with charismatic Christians, of which most of us are, because we believe in the charisma, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because they do weird things when it comes to the fight, to the spiritual warfare, right? They rebuke, they bind, they loose, they shout, they anoint, they, they march, they do crazy things. And in my opinion, they preach a defeated devil right back into business. I don't want to do that, but if I don't take up the fight 
in the way that God instructs us, I will live a defeated life. Okay, so there is a fight, there is a fight of faith. And just like Wonder Woman, we have superhero uh, powers, right? Well, we actually do one better than that. We have the superhero living in us, right? Because Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, lives in us. We have the very most amazing superhero living in and through us. And in addition, he has supplied us with weapons, and we're going to look at those today. We actually have supernatural armor, just like Wonder Woman. Do you know, even as a child, she wore her armor and she never took it off, which I think is a lesson for all of us. Because as we look at this today, we're, we're being <laughs> encouraged, don't take it off. You wear it at all times, okay? So the Apostle Paul is the one who in the scripture describes for us the armor of God. And... Uh, before I get started reading this, it's in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, I want to be clear. The armor of God is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for our identity as sons and daughters of the living God, our identity in Christ. And so to that end, you know, it becomes a very, very powerful weapon. So let's look at what Paul says here in Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand firm. So it's pretty clear. There is a devil, and he's got forces, and we're in a battle, okay? And I know there's quite a few people who don't even believe he's real. He's real. Now, what this portion of the text is telling us is how to be prepared. And then he'll go on to describe the armor, of which we'll just discuss basically one piece today. But three steps of preparation that are very important that uh, Paul addresses here. And number one is be strong in the Lord. In other words, make a choice. Again, this isn't automatic. This is something we do every day. We dial up to our awareness, however you best do that. And you make a choice to not operate out of your own strength which can be difficult for some of us. But the reality is we are weak apart from him. And the truth is he actually is in us. So when it says be strong in the Lord, it's referring to the union that we have with him. The reality, he lives in us and through us, and we can tap in to that strength. And that's no tiny, like, minuscule strength. No, because we know Jesus Christ defeated all those cosmic forces, right, at the cross and the resurrection. He's now ascended. He said, all authority's been given me. And he's taken us with him. We're seated with him. We've been given authority in his name. We don't just tack that on to a prayer. That gives us the right to invoke the victory that Jesus won. And so we every day acquaint ourselves again. We we. Make the choice. No, I'm going to choose to be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might because Jesus has defeated all the evil forces and now we go in his name. Well, secondly, we put on the full armor of God. And that's really important because, again, this is a, a metaphor uh, for our identity in Christ. And just a little aside, when um, I was a younger Christian, I heard several teachings, I bought into them, that what it means to put armor on the armor of God is you stand in front of the mirror every day and you put on the helmet. You put on the breastplate of righteousness. You take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word, the belt of truth, the feet with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and you do that. Can I just say there's a boatload of superstition in the Christian church like, okay, if I don't do that, the enemy is going to get me. I mean, if you want to stand in front of the mirror and do that, that's okay. But that's not actually what this text is talking about. Put on, the Greek word there is sink into. 
immerse yourself into the reality of who you are in Jesus Christ. And what better description than the armor? We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the helmet of salvation, salvation, wholeness, body, mind, soul, spirit. We want truth. Man, with all the voices out there today, we need the spirit of truth leading and guiding us. We take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then, hey, our feet already have the gospel of peace. We get to announce the victory's already been won. That's what it means when we say the kingdom of God is here. The victory's been won, and we're here to enforce it. So we want to immerse ourselves into the reality of all that, that means. It's so rich. It's so powerful. So we put on the full armor of God. We sink into the reality of our union in him. And then thirdly, we stand. And again, I think we need to hear this. Christians do a lot of crazy things, running a lot of places, listening to a lot of things, doing a lot of stuff. Actually, three times in this text, if you read the whole text, Paul says, stand. Stand. Just stand. Okay? Now, there will be a time that we're going to speak about in a few minutes. We're going to actually take up the shield of faith. But we can stand with full confidence in the one who's inside of us because we're battling not flesh and blood, not our husbands or wives or friends or co-workers or bosses. That, they, the enemy might be using them. That's not our enemy. We are in a real battle with cosmic forces. And Jesus' spirit supplies us with everything we need to stand. As a matter of fact, the prayer that Paul prayed before he um, even in, in the beginning of Ephesians was he said, I pray that you will understand the magnitude of Jesus' mighty power. Jesus' mighty power. He said, I pray you'd understand it towards us who believe. See, we have to believe. We have to believe. And that's that whole issue of being in the fight of faith. See, our faith is critical. We need to know how do we fight the fight of faith that actually <laughs> accomplishes something. You know, faith accomplishes the impossible. Faith is really, really important. It's very important to Jesus. And so one of the pieces of the armor that we're going to look at today specifically is the shield of faith. And Paul says this, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all darts of the evil one. Do you want to know how to use the shield of faith? Because in all circumstances, all, you can extinguish, you can put out, you can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. I want to live that way. I don't always. I want to. So when my four boys were younger, um, they loved to play war. Yeah, I was one of those moms that let my boys play war. Hey, let's let boys be boys. Okay, I guess girls are in the war now. But anyway, and I'm a pacifist. Well, anyway, they loved using the garbage can lids as shields, right? And they ran around the neighborhood, you know, with their shield. And isn't that the picture we have of the shield, right? Well, except that's not the picture at all that's pictured in Ephesians 6. The shield of faith that Paul is addressing there is the Roman shield of faith, and it is actually a door-sized shield. I mean, would you rather be behind a garbage can lid, or would you rather be behind the shield of faith, wherewith you can quench all fiery darts of the evil one, right? <laughs> now, my son-in-law, uh, Mike, yesterday I was just like, oh, you know, I want a visual for this. I want people to see it covers all of you. I want them to see how powerful the shield of faith is. He's like, oh, I could make that. I'm like, you could make it like today? Like I'm preaching, you know, like in 10 hours. Yep, he has all the tools in his garage. He put it together and I think he did an awesome job illustrating <laughs> the door size shield of faith. <laughs> you see, faith is very important to God. How many times did Jesus say to his disciples, why are you afraid? Why are you so anxious? Why are you in despair? Why don't you believe? Where is your faith? 
he was a little annoyed. And I don't want him to be annoyed. <laughs> and I know he's the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, he's saying, this is the way you live. You are to live by faith with the assurance that things you hope for, but you don't yet see, you have the confidence it will happen. And that's what faith is. Well, unfortunately, many of us don't live by faith, and I'm, I'm just as guilty. But we, you know, find it much more comfortable to live by feelings, okay? I mean, I don't feel like going to small group. I don't feel loved. I don't feel happy. I don't feel... I don't feel, or I feel anxious, I feel depressed. We live by feelings. Now, I'm not saying those feelings aren't real. They're very real. They're very real. I'm not asking you to deny feelings. They're God-given feelings. Okay, they alert us to something being wrong. But maybe you don't live by feelings. Maybe you're a person who lives by facts. Okay, well, the fact is, I lost my job and we have no money. The fact is... The, the doctor's report says cancer. The fact is, my wife said, I don't love you anymore, I want out. Those are the facts. I mean, how many of us have said, well, it is what it is? Is it? Because when you live by faith, when you take up the shield of faith, you have another choice. You can quench that fiery dart of the evil one. And that's what we want to see. How do we go about doing that so that yeah, we acknowledge the feelings, we acknowledge the facts, but I want to know how to live by faith. Okay, so, now, again, let's just remember, in all circumstances, and often the circumstances are those facts. They're the bad reports. They're the actual situation. But in all circumstances, we can quench the fiery dart that's coming at us, that's bringing despair, that's bringing fear, that's bringing anxiety, that's messing with our life. We can quench it when we take up the shield of faith. And I want to talk just a second about that verb, take up. Like, it's not just take, like I receive something. No, it's an action. You know, faith has action. James wrote a whole book about that. Do you know even the demons believe that's right. But when you don't put action to your faith, and I mean spirit-empowered action, then nothing happens. The fiery dart is not quenched, okay? So we want to learn, how do we actually take up this door-sized shield of faith? Well, interestingly, there, I mean, there's tons of things we could address. I want to look at just two areas, okay, and illustrate with this. When difficult circumstances come, and they come to all of us, okay, large and small, when difficult circumstances come, I really need to take up faith in my identity as a son or daughter of the living God, who has been given authority over all power of the evil one. And he, he will challenge that over and over and over. Let me give you a, a story to illustrate. So many of you know in our family, we, we've gone through kind of a difficult time in the past couple of months. The oldest son of uh, my daughter, Julie, and her husband, Mike, has had some pretty severe seizures, and, you know, the, the brain's going wild. It's very, very frightening to witness this, and yeah, it's just a very scary situation. And, of course, we've had lots of prayer and wonderful support, but... Um, we, we, you know, hit a, kind of a wall with a pretty bad report. And so, as always, I'm, you know, you have the choice. Like, just go, well, it, it is what it is. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because you can take up the shield of faith and you can quench all fiery darts. Now, we have an enemy. He's just, you know, relentless. But we have a king who has victory over that enemy and he lives inside of us so okay i'm just kind of meditating like oh god i don't know like i don't know how to pray i don't know what to do and i hear a voice and the voice says you don't have faith for this you don't have faith well whose voice is that it's the adversary it's satan something i've learned long ago in certain situations i do what jesus say i agree with the adversary i don't argue I'm like, you're right, I don't have faith. But I know someone who does. 
and he lives in me. See, that's a big difference. And so I hand Jesus my unbelief, and I tell, you, tell him, you've got to help me with my unbelief. And, you know, he pricks my mind because that's a quote directly out of Mark 9 with the father who had what? A son who was having seizures. Some of you have stopped reading this. Oh, yeah, maybe, you know, verse or two. Where do you think faith comes from? Faith comes from hearing the word as the Holy Spirit breathes the word, speaks the word. You got to pick up your Bibles or your tablets or however you read it, okay? Because I'm reading that whole story and I'm like, wow, Lord, like, yes, and, but I don't quite know what to do about it. So I, I use actually another piece of the armor, which is... Um, Many people leave out of the armor, but it's mentioned here in Ephesians 6.18, pray in the Spirit, which I take to mean as praying in tongues, at all times, on every occasion, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Okay, fine. I'm praying, I'm praying. Like, help me, Lord. I don't, how do I, how do I pray about this? How? And that leads me to worship, which is another incredible weapon, which isn't mentioned here, but why? Because it gets your eyes on him, like Adam encouraged us last week. And I begin, and I just begin to sing that song, you know, it is well with my soul, the new version. You know, far be it from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, right? And then it was, and this is what, you know, I was just singing, like uh, the, the words that said, you know, even the, the waves and the wind still know his name. So let it go, my soul, and trust in him. And I'm going, yes, even the weight and the Holy Spirit dropped into my heart. The brain waves know the name of Jesus. So speak to them. And you tell them, like the waves on the sea, to be still. It was a very powerful moment very powerful moment. We were actually driving through the night to, to go on our vacation. They were in the other van, and that's why I had so much anxiety, because I didn't want him to have a seizure in the van. And, and uh, wow, I took up that shield of faith. I believe that, God. I believe the wind and the waves still know your name, and I can say, brain waves be still. Praise God so far, four weeks, seizure free. Now, not just me. I'm not, no, no. Lots of other prayers. Continual prayers. But I'm thankful. Take up the shield of faith. So, he'll come after your identity. But secondly, and this is very ongoing, he will come after your destiny. You see, every person sitting here, do you know you have a book that God wrote about you before you were even born? He wrote in your book all the amazing things he had for you to do and to be. All of us have a book. We have a destiny. It's recorded for us. But all oh, the enemy is doing everything he can to make sure we don't walk in any of it. And that's why tragedy takes us out. Failure takes us out. You know, just life takes us out because we think, well, I've blown it. It's too late. It, you know, no, no, no. His name is Redeemer. Okay? And so you want to take up the shield of faith in regards to the purpose that God has ordained for your life. Because those fiery darts will try to get you to just give up. 2 Timothy 1, 9 is one of the many scriptures that reference this. And it says this, He saved us, called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus when before the ages began. See, he not only gives us purpose, he gives us grace. His empowering to live it out. You have an amazing destiny. You have purpose. It doesn't matter if you've blown it, if you've screwed up. It doesn't matter. We have a redeemer. We have a redeemer, and we can enforce that victory that he won for us by taking up the shield of faith, shield of faith that we can live a life as a son or daughter of the living God enforcing the victory over the enemy. And so often people say to me, well, I, I don't, what? I have no idea what my purpose is. What are you passionate about? What do you love? What do you have energy for? 
That's part of how God made you. So stop looking over there and over there and on Facebook and all the other places the enemy uses to screw up our ideas of who we are and who God has called us to be. And listen to the spirit in you that you can fulfill the destiny, which is amazing, no matter who you are. It's so good. Well, you know, the enemy likes to come at us, and that's why we need the shield of faith. Lord Jesus, I do believe you have a destiny for me. I want to share with you the story of Regina Harrington. That's the wife of Clay. And I love her story of how she's taken the shield of faith, discovered God's purpose for her life, and she's quenched a lot of fiery darts. And she's just getting ready this week to lead a team with the Convoy of Hope to Tanzania. So listen up to her story. She said, My passion for missions in Africa was birthed out of the tremendous grief I experienced when I lost someone very dear to me, mentor, teacher, like a second father or older brother. When he told me he had contracted HIV, I knew it was a death sentence, and I was a freshman in college when he died. I then made it part of my life mission to do something to help others who are, who are affected, and it all pointed to where HIV AIDS originated, which was Africa. It would have been easy in my grief to develop anger toward Africa, but instead I felt intense compassion. Holy Spirit showing her what she's made for. I had only a glimpse of the impact of AIDS on one person and the family, and I knew that entire communities in Africa were suffering even more. So with this, God planted a seed of faith, but it would take 21 years before I would ever step foot on the continent. You see, faith is for the unseen. I was officially wrecked after my first trip to Swaziland, Africa, which is known as the nation of orphans due to the high rate of HIV AIDS that's left many children without parents. I knew returning to Africa was part of God's purpose for me. Throughout my journey, I felt God give me simple instructions like seek knowledge, be bold, be fearless. I had to believe even when the circumstances screamed, no money, no time, no way, not you, you're the mother of four, right? But this trip, this month, will be my fourth, and God is not done with me yet. I'm no less motivated now than I was 25 years ago, in fact, more so. And so I want you to know, uh, is Regina in the Urbana service? Will you please stand? Let's just give her a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! 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 I, I traveled to Tanzania last year with Regina. I want you to know she is a signs and wonder woman. She is. Because she prayed for the sick. She shared the gospel. She loved the orphans. She fed them. It I watched her. I was in amazement. I didn't feel the same passion, and you can kind of feel guilty about that, you know? Uh, but that's when I learned her story and how God birthed. That's part of her purpose. And so she will lead that team this week. We're going to pray for that team uh, after the service uh, ministry time today. So, you know, I want us all take up the door size shield of faith, right? Get rid of that garbage can. Come on. Okay? Because we want to be the victorious sons and daughters of the living God, right? We want to, we're destined to fulfill kingdom purposes. We are sent to be signs and wonder women and men to make the world a much better place. Why? Because the superhero lives in us. Thank you, Father. Yeah, so thankful you invite us. We get to be superheroes with you. For your purposes. This is always to set the captives free. So thank you. I pray that you minister to your people as we worship you today and discover more and more who you are and how to have that faith that quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy. Amen. Thanks for listening to the message today. To experience more powerful messages, go to vineyardlive.us or Join our Vineyard Life Plus community to view conferences, trainings, and special teachings.